Welcome uh, to you all, whether you're here in person or you're watching from the comfort of your own home. We're going to open with words this morning from the set psalm for today, which is Psalm 19, uh, which speaks of the awesomeness of God's creation. Reading from verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Uh, great words of the awesomeness of our God. And we're going to carry on praising God, singing together, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. that we've just sung, sung, you are great and most worthy of our praise. <coughs> and so, Lord, now we lift your name on high and we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives and we thank you for your unfailing love to each one of us, no matter who we are, no matter what we have done. Your love for us is unending. And Lord, as we think of your holiness and perfection, it brings us to our knees and we become so aware of our own failings, our own imperfections. And Lord, now in a time of confession, we admit we so often are not worthy of your unconditional love. We so often let you down in all sorts of ways. So Lord, we just take this opportunity now to lay before you the things that we know that we've got wrong. 
And Lord, I for one know that that list is quite long. And we ask for your forgiveness, Lord. We ask for your cleansing. And Lord, time and time again, I, I find it hard to believe that you hold none of my failures against me. And it's the same for everyone. You forgive and set us free from the past. So help us truly believe in that forgiveness that you so freely offer when we come before you like this. So Jesus declares our sins are forgiven and we now open our hearts and receive that forgiveness in faith. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So in a moment, uh, we're going to hear two short Bible readings uh, from the Old Testament. And we're doing that ahead of looking at our New Testament reading, the set New Testament reading for today. And I want to share these Old Testament readings as I think they're really important background for our understanding when we come to our New Testament re reading. And I love it when God reveals to us how much the Bible is so joined up. There are the most amazing connections throughout the whole Bible. Of course, the Bible contains one overarching message. And this morning, we're going to discover some wonderful examples of the connections between uh, the different parts of the Bible. Penny's going to come and read in a minute, but she's firstly going to read from Leviticus, which is the third book in the Old Testament uh, section of our Bible. And I wonder how many of us ever delve into the book of Leviticus. Um, I know I don't very often at all, but it, it actually gives a lot of teaching as to how the Jews, God's chosen people, were to live their lives. And then secondly, we're going to hear a few words from the prophet Isaiah. Just a reminder that a prophet is a spokesperson for God. And so God spoke the words we're going to hear through Isaiah over 700 years before Jesus came. So thank you, Penny. The first reading is headed, The Year of Jubilee, Leviticus 25, verses 8 to 13. Count off seven Sabbath years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbath years amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. The fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you, do not sow, and do not reap what grows of itself, or harvest the untended vines, for it is a jubilee, and it is to be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. In this year of jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. And from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from the darkness for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Okay, we'll return to those readings in a moment, but first let's move to the set New Testament reading for today. And we're in Luke's Gospel at the minute in the set readings, and, and we're right at the start of Luke's account of Jesus's adult life. Now, just a reminder of where we are, just a reminder that Jesus didn't start his work, his mission, if you like, his ministry, um, until he was 30 years old. Up until that time, he'd worked away quite unnoticed in Nazareth as a carpenter, but his baptism by John the Baptist had marked his call to action, if you like. The time had come. 
the next stage of God's plan was about to unfold. And immediately after Jesus' baptism by John, Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He then came out of the wilderness empowered by God's Spirit for the work that was before him, for the work that God wanted him to do. And this is where we take up the story. He's just come out of the wilderness. Now, it's taken from Luke 4, verses 14 to 20. It's not on the screen. Um, I'm not going to read it direct from Scripture. As I often do, instead I'm going to try and bring the story alive, make it a little bit easier to listen to. So I've written uh, the story in my own words, if you like, as if I had been there. Words, words, never realised until last Saturday just how powerful a few words can be. Let me explain. Last Saturday in Nazareth, there was some, somehow an air of excitement in the town. There is a local carpenter called Jesus who has lived here for about 30 years. Well, it seemed he suddenly disappeared. He just wasn't around anymore and no one heard sight nor sound of him oh, for over 40 days. And then I heard through people that knew his family that he appeared again and he'd started preaching in the area. And the word was out that he was saying some amazing things and in fact was given a bit of a reputation for th stirring things up a bit. An awful lot of people were talking about this chap. Well, the news last Saturday was that he was home, as I say, after months away. And of course, the word was out that he was bound to be at the synagogue. I was going to make sure I was there. When I walked into the synagogue, there was a real buzz in the place. The place was heaving with people, and there was almost an air of excitement and anticipation. And yes, Jesus was there. I could not have imagined for a moment how it was going to turn out. The service went quite normally at first. Anyway, it came to that bit where somebody has to come out and read from the scriptures. Suddenly, it was like the congregation had been connected to the mains. Jesus stood up and there was this fantastic buzz in the air. He marches to the front and they hand him the scroll of Isaiah. What is he going to read? What great teaching will he give us afterwards? He then starts to read. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, he said. God, you could say that again. You could see the fire in him. There was such power in his voice and in how he spoke those words. I'll never forget it. But he carried on. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom from the prisoners, to bring recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. He then paused for a moment, and you could hear a pin drop. Every eye in the place was staring at him. Then he looked up from the scroll and his gaze went through you like an arrow straight to your heart. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the steward and sat down. And by the way, when you sit down like that in a synagogue, it means you're going to say something. It means you're going to teach. And he said, then said the most amazing words. He said, and at this very moment, right here and now, this prophecy has been fulfilled. There was a gasp, a real sharp intake of breath. Some folks were obviously shocked to the core. Others began hugging them, each other in delight. Do you realise what he was saying? What power his words had? He didn't have to say much, but wow, I really still can't believe this is the man who had lived amongst us for 30 years. So that's our story uh, from Luke's Gospel, and we'll unpack it uh, in a moment. Um, but first, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing, Light of the World, You Step Down Into Darkness.
return to that Bible reading, that story from Luke, when Jesus said those amazing words in the synagogue. And we're going to unpack um, what's going on here under my three usual headings, which all ask the question, what? Hopefully they'll come up. There we go. Um, we're going to ask three what's. The first, we're going to say, what? What is going on here? We're then going to ask, so what? What has this story to do with us here in the year 2022? And then we're going to ask, now what? What are we going to do as a result of what we've heard or learned this morning? So, to our first what. What is going on here? Well, I hope you picked up from my retelling of the story that Jesus' words were astounding to his audience. And I wonder if you recognised those words that Jesus spoke. They were the very same words we heard earlier from Isaiah, the book of Isaiah that Penny read to us. God spoke those exact words through Isaiah over 700 years uh, before Jesus came. And those words that Isaiah spoke were all about God's plan in the future for his people, about God's plan to save his people. God's chosen people kept getting it wrong and turning their backs on God. But God wasn't going to leave them just to get on with it. In his love for mankind, he was going to send someone who was going to save mankind forever. But to really understand the language used and to really understand the amazingly clever way God was communicating with his people at the time of Jesus, we need to delve further back into the Old Testament to Leviticus and understand some of the associations that the language used would have sparked off in people's minds. And I must admit, I love doing this, so bear, bear with me. I find this all very fascinating, uh, as you discover how joined up uh, the Bible, of course, is. So let's go back to Leviticus, that reading we heard. That's the third book in the Old Testament sections of our Bible. And remember, we said Leviticus gives a, a lot of teaching as to how the Jews were to live their lives. It gave them detailed instructions on how they were to be God's holy people, set apart for a life lived with God at the centre. And it actually contains instruction after instruction about every detail of their lives. And that's why we don't spend a lot of time looking at Leviticus. But the bit we heard from Leviticus 25 is just really relevant here. And were instructions for the Jews on a concept known as the year of the Jubilee. Now, we're familiar with this word Jubilee. We will be celebrating the Queen's Platinum Jubilee this coming year. And we think of it as a word indicating a significant anniversary, really. But its use in the Bible has a different meaning. Let me explain. The Jewish calendar was based on the number seven, okay? Every seventh day was called the Sabbath. We know that much. And this day was set apart for worship and fellowship. No work was to be done on that day. It was a day to be holy, set apart for the Lord. Now, every seventh year was a Sabbath year. In that year, no sowing or reaping could be done. And every seventh Sabbath year would usher in a year called the year of the Jubilee. So at the end of every 49 years, the year of the Jubilee would begin. And that's what's being explained in our reading, in our Leviticus reading. And I love the concept here. And I've just got a, a slide that, uh, that says, yes, in the 50th year, it was a year of Jubilee. So the year of the Jubilee was the great equaliser, if you like, uh, in the Jewish way of life. Verse 10 of what Penny read, it said, Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. So every 50 years, 
slaves were to be set free, leases were to expire, debts were to be forgiven, and property was to be returned to its original owners. So this was a way for God to remind people that the land was not really theirs, but that God had entrusted it to them. This kept people from buying up huge parcels of land. No one could grow too rich and no one would be perpetually poor. No matter how bleak a person's life was, the year of the Jubilee provided hope. It provided real hope, you can see this. Everything would be made right again every 50 years at the year of the Jubilee. I'd say I love this powerful principle, really. I can't imagine it ever working today, but, but this is, I think it's a powerful principle. So let's fast forward from Leviticus to the book of Isaiah. That was about a span of another 700 years. And as we've just said, at this point, at the time of Isaiah, God's people were in a mess. They didn't live their lives as God wanted. God comes up with another plan. And as we said, through his prophet, begins to speak about what will happen in the future. We heard it in Isaiah 61. And God promises, through the mouthpiece of Isaiah, a deliverer that will bring hope and healing and most of all, freedom and liberty. But what we have to notice and what the Jews would have noticed is the language used is the same as the language used in Leviticus. It's the year of the Jubilee language that's being used. The principle of the year of Jubilee, which brought freedom and liberty, has now become a promise of deliverance for God's people forever going forward, which would bring the people freedom and liberty forever. Fast forward to Luke another 700 years, and Jesus stands up in the synagogue right at the start of his mission and quotes the prophecy. There it is. And he says, the words from Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed. And one line that isn't on there, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. This is Jubilee language. This is Jubilee language. The last line, uh, not on the screen, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, is talking about that special Jubilee year. And Jesus goes on to say, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus shocks the group by claiming the principle of the year of Jubilee that they all know about and the promise of a coming deliverer are found in him, in a person. And that person is himself. The words of Isaiah are echoing in their ears and Jesus announces that he is the Jubilee going forward. He has not come to usher in a year of jubilee. He's come to usher in an age forevermore of jubilee. Everything was going to be made right again, which the people understood is what jubilee meant. Everything is going to be made right again. But now in a completely different way, through him, through Jesus. The group is stunned. Here was the promised one the one who has come to liberate them and free them. The promised Messiah had finally arrived and he was sitting right in front of them. The sense of excitement would have been amazing. Imagine the buzz in that place. The long-awaited Messiah was here bringing an age of jubilee, not just a jubilee every 50 years. Okay, you may be sitting, oh, this is all very interesting. Well, I, I think it's interesting. Um, and it's a lovely link between Jesus, Isaiah, and the book of Leviticus. But we now need to know what those particular words of Jesus 
you know, whether they've got anything to do with us sitting here this morning. So let's move on. And ask our second question, our second what. So what? What's this all got to do with us today? Well, these, what, those words that Jesus spoke are just as important to us today, 2,000 more than 2,000 years later. I would say the words Jesus spoke are timeless and have applied to every generation since Jesus came to earth. Because for me, the words sum up, actually, the reason why Jesus came and give us the re what exactly he came to do. Let's look at them again on that uh, screen. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me, this is Jesus speaking about himself, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. He came to set the oppressed free. Okay, so looking at those words, every age has poor people, blind people, oppressed people, people in prison. So are we to take these words literally? Thinking um, about those words, I'm not particularly poor. We're certainly not in prison. And although I do know a few folks that are blind, I know Betty has problems with the sight, my mum is virtually blind. But, you know, generally, few of us are blind. So what is this saying to us today? And I must admit, you could spend numerous sermons unpacking these words, but we've only got time for a whistle-stop tour of some brief thoughts as to what these words are, are all about. So let's just unpack some of it. So firstly, Jesus says, empowered and anointed by God, he came to proclaim good news to the poor. But what does that mean? Sounds as though Jesus has come to free all poor people from poverty, and it doesn't mean that. But it must be said that God did want to show, he made a, a priority of showing the poor and the disadvantaged were really important to him. But what does this really mean? And I've got a, just a, a slide there to focus on. Jesus didn't come to make everyone middle class and give them a four bedroom house and a double garage. So who are the poor that we are talking about? Well, you see, I believe without Jesus in our lives, we are all poor. The poor to me is anyone who is yet to find Jesus Christ. Jesus came to free each and every one of us from our poverty. But of course, many of us do not see that we're living in poverty. We see poverty as those children in Africa that are starving. We see poverty, those families in Afghanistan really struggling at the minute, or, or we see poverty in those that are homeless. But the sort of poverty Jesus is talking about here is a description of a life lived oblivious to God and oblivious to Jesus and what he came to do. The poverty Jesus is talking about, that Isaiah spoke about 700 years before Jesus, is a spiritual poverty. A spiritual poverty. So many people cannot see their need for God, especially if they have a lot of money, as money makes people feel secure. But often, so often, wealthy people suffer from a spiritual poverty in that they are without God and they rely on money as opposed to God. So Jesus came to set us free from our spiritual poverty, which is such good news. Why is it such good news? And I know I bang on about this all the time, but you see, I think it's so simple. Life only works. God's way as that's the way he designed it in the first place. Life will always feel out of kilter and not right 
if God is not at the centre of our lives. And the good news of Jesus Christ is the best news for each and every one of us because a relationship with him enables us to live at one with God forevermore, which is how God designed things to work in the first place. And this brings us such wealth, spiritual wealth and hope. Spiritual wealth and hope to me are priceless commodities. Last week in our service of sharing, we heard about this amazing wealth that people get from their relationship with God through Jesus. Our members of our church family and our testimony services again and again share the wealth that they get from Christ. But I think we will all be aware we are surrounded in this world with poor, spiritually poor people who have no hope. So let's come back to our words of Jesus. Next, Jesus says he came to proclaim freedom for, for, for the prisoners, freedom for the captives. And again, I don't interpret this literally. We cannot interpret this literally. He doesn't really mean people in prison. Jesus wouldn't tell us to open all the prison doors and let everybody go free. If you look up the definition of prisoner in the dictionary, prisoner is someone whose freedom is restricted, who is restrained by something and or someone. Just look at our society. How many people are actually captive to something? Restricted by something? There are the extreme examples. Some folk are completely captive to their addictions. Drugs, sex, pornography, alcohol. Maybe these are things that we maybe can't personally relate to. But I wonder if we're all captive to something to a greater or lesser extent. What about food, chocolate, overeating, computer games, our job, our family, watching TV? All these things we can become captive to and they can restrict our relationship with God. They become a barrier between us and him. And you may be sitting there thinking, well, no, that's not me. But as I say, I do wonder whether we are all prisoners to some degree. Some of us maybe hide our prison bars better than others. And we either deny or don't realise we need to be set free. We may be behind the prison bars of fear, the bars of worry or regret or guilt or the bars of our ageing, decaying bodies. These bars are as real and able to isolate us, imprison us and separate us from God as our metal bars. And Jesus came to set us free. He died on that cross so that we can come before him and come before God and get rid of all this stuff that restricts us, that restricts our freedom. Coming back to the words Jesus spoke, he then said, I have come to give recovery of sight for the blind. And what does he mean here if, he's not, if it doesn't mean that he's going to heal the blind people? Once again, this isn't to be taken literally. We're talking here about spiritual blindness. Let's us all ask the question of ourselves, how is our vision? How is our spiritual vision? And I must, a bit, just a little bit about my story, I must admit, I came to church for years, all through my childhood, into my youth and into my 20s. But my sight, my spiritual sight was not good. I thought I was getting it right. I was coming to church, but I can see now that I spent years being very spiritually blind. I was too busy with my life, my job, living and working in London and enjoying all 
that that brought, which led to a, a spiritual blindness. So yes, I went to church, but I didn't understand. I couldn't see what I was missing, that I could have a personal relationship with Jesus. I kept letting other things get in the way. I didn't pray. I didn't read my Bible. I thought just going to church was enough. And boy, do I remember the time I moved from blindness to sight. I was in my late 20s, early 30s, and how the scale seemed to fall away from my eyes. Boy. Uh, and I saw everything differently, and I was so excited about what I had discovered. But, but I still acknowledge I still don't have completely clear vision. And I believe the journey to complete sight, spiritual sight, takes a lifetime. And my prayer continues to be, heal my spiritual blindness, Lord. So let's all ask this question, how is our spiritual sight? Or do you know people who seem to have spiritual scales on their eyes? They just cannot see who Jesus is. But Jesus came to heal the spiritually blind. Jesus said, I have come to give recovery of sight to the blind. And as I was preparing this week, my thoughts immediately went, as I was thinking about spiritual blindness, to a man called John Newton, who is such a good example of a person whose spiritual blindness was cured with such dramatic results. And he wrote about what happened in a very famous hymn. He was a, a godless man who was part of the slave trade in the early 1800s. And he was given to fits of rage and anger and drunkenness. But then Jesus opened his eyes and John Newton saw Jesus for who he was and he was completely transformed. And he went on to fight for the abolition of slavery and wrote many, many hymns that we sing today. And of course, what I'm talking about is that wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, which we're going to sing in a moment. And he describes the process of him receiving his spiritual sight. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. So just to finish, we're going to ask our third question, our third what, now what? What we're going to do as the result of what we've learned this morning? What do we feel God saying to us this morning? We need to ask ourselves some very simple questions. Do you want wealth? The sort of wealth and riches that has nothing to do with money. A relationship with Jesus will give you untold riches and wealth. Are you imprisoned by guilt or worry or regret or bitterness or alcohol or drugs? Jesus came to set us free. Jesus is the key to escaping from the prison. And then lastly, how is your sight? Can you see who Jesus really is and see what he, that he wants to be part of your life? We must, we must trust in Jesus and ask him into our lives and ask him to cure our spiritual blindness and release us from our prisons. He sets us free and provides us with untold riches. So in a time of prayer and quiet now, we're going to pray through these things and I trust God will speak to each and every one of us. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you now and we admit our spiritual poverty without you. 
But Lord, we're so often too busy, too distracted to truly see who you are and what you could mean in our lives. So we ask now that you give each one of us a fresh revelation of yourself. Help us feel your presence right now. Help us encounter you afresh. Heal any spiritual blindness we may have. And Lord, we also ask that you heal the blindness of those we know who cannot see the love that you have for them. And Lord, we come before you now and ask for your help in discerning the things in life that are keeping us captive, keeping us behind bars. And we choose now to put our trust in you. We ask you into our lives and that you set us free from our worries, our guilt or anything that distracts us from you. Lord, thank you for your love for us. That love which is so great that we can hardly get our heads around it. And that you want the best for us. And Lord, now we just pray for those whom we know that especially need your love or your healing touch this morning. And we name them in our hearts now. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for our passages of scripture this morning. Thank you that you hear our prayers. Thank you that you know where our hearts are. Touch us afresh, we pray in this coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're now going to sing that wonderful uh, hymn song, uh, Amazing Grace. We are, we are going to sing a slightly modern version of it, which uses uh, John Newton's verses, but then adds a chorus. And, and I'm using this version because I love the chorus, which says, my chains are gone, I've been set free. And they, they just seem really apt for what we've been talking about uh, this morning. So thank you guys, amazing grace.
The blessing of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you today and always. Amen.